<laughs> Easter began in the dark when spirits were crushed and the world was hurting and hope had seemed foolish. But we see a new day dawning. See what love has done and listen, for the story we are about to hear has the power to reshape the whole world. Christ had fallen, all hope was gone. But in the mystery of God's unending love, the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. Life is on the loose. So let us join our voices with all creation, proclaiming the good news of this day. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Let us pray. 
When the morning is quiet and the world still sleeps and love breathes again, we praise you, God of resurrection. When the day is new and the light is clean and the stone is rolled away, we praise you, God of renewal. When the time is now and the place is here and the grave clothes are folded, we praise you, God of reconciliation. Death was yesterday, new life is today. Tombs once sealed are now open. All assumptions about what is and is not possible have been swallowed up in the mystery of Easter. Amen. Christ our God poured out love even unto death for our sakes. Because of this, we have been given the promise that no power on earth, no sin, no debt, no trespass, not even death itself can separate us from the love of God. This is a miraculous grace. Let us celebrate it together by passing the peace and then taking that peace out into the world. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. You may be seated. You still have a stack of these? It is a joy to welcome you here on Easter Sunday to University Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you are with us today, especially if you are our guest. We hope you will feel a warm welcome. And if you are worshiping with us online, either right now or later in the week, we are glad you are here. 
A few things about our day here together. One is if you are a child and didn't get a worship bag or a special sticker bulletin, you're welcome to do that to help you through worship today. After worship, um, those of you who would like to, we would love these lilies that grace our sanctuary and around the building to be delivered to those who might need a cheerful sign. And so you are welcome, whether you purchased them or donated to the IFC to get them here or not, everyone is welcome to take a lily and bring it to a neighbor. In your bulletin, you will find a lot of things that describe our life together at University Presbyterian Church. I invite you to take that home and note what's coming. We have a mental health task force here and they will be starting a Sunday school next week. We have a contemplative service um, that uses music from the Taze community and that there's a special service coming up next week for that as well. Later in April, we'll have a special music Sunday where we'll read the different stories of Easter. It's sort of an Easter lessons and carols. We invite you to that. Also, children later in April are invited to participate in a service project with our outreach partner, Table. Also, if you're in the room, along the center aisle is a friendship pad. That's so we can know the names of those of us who are here and make them feel at home. That's all of our work. And if you are new and would like to leave your email, we're happy to let you know more of what's going on in our life together. But it is good that you all are here. And now I'd like to invite the children forward for a time with Pastor Nancy. You did? Well, last week we did Palm on that sounds better. <laughs> last week on Palm Sunday, we waved our palms and shouted Hosanna. And then on Maundy Thursday, all of these things that we brought in today were carried out of the sanctuary, just out the center aisle, just like they came in today. And that's because we were getting ready for Good Friday which is when we remember that Jesus died on the cross. And Good Friday is, it's a sad thing to remember that Jesus died on the cross. And so we didn't want to have all these things in here because these are all things that we use to help us celebrate. And so that's why today it all came back in because today is a day full of joy, a day when we celebrate that Jesus is alive. And you know what? There's another thing that we, another thing that we say on this day and sing on this day that we haven't done in a while, and that's the word alleluia. You've probably already heard it a lot this morning. Can you say that word? Alleluia. Well, we're going to say it three times, and the first time we're going to whisper it, and then we're going to say it in a normal voice, and then we're going to shout it. Alleluia is a word that means praise to God, so it's a day, a word we use on joyous days like this. Okay, so the first time we're going to whisper it, okay? Alleluia. Now we're going to say it in a normal voice. Alleluia. And now shout it as loud as you can. Alleluia. 
Alleluia. Praise to God. Jesus is alive. After we pray, we have a sticker to give you, and it has a butterfly on it because a butterfly, a butterfly is a symbol of new life, and it says the word Alleluia. And I want you to think about where to put this. I want you to ask somebody permission before you decide where to stick it. But maybe like on a water bottle or a lunch box or on something next to your bed so that every time you, can, you see it, you remember, Alleluia, Jesus is risen. He is alive. Probably not on your face because then it won't be there tomorrow. Okay, let's say a prayer together. I'll say a line and you can say it after me, okay? Thank you, God, for this Easter day. Thank you, God, for this Easter day. Thank you, God, that Jesus is alive. And his love lasts forever. Amen. Brett Turner teaches first grade in the Bay Area. He enjoys giving his students word puzzles. One day he had this one written on the board. I am the beginning of everything, the end of everywhere. I am the beginning of eternity, the end of time and space. What am I? The intended answer is the letter E, beginning of everything, end of everywhere. But one of his students shot up her hand and blurted out, I know, I know, it's death. Well, a solemn hush fell across the class, silencing the usual flood of excited answers. And Mr. Turner didn't feel like telling them the answer was boring old E anymore. You know, death has a way of doing that, putting a full stop to all conversation. It must have felt that way for the disciples on Easter morning. Jesus is dead, all their hope along with him. There is no recovering from this. So, my friends, a good news reading from the 20th chapter of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? 
She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was him. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So resurrection, that's the word of the day. Resurrection can be described in many ways. It's mysterious, it's amazing, it's confounding, it's unbelievable. All of those adjectives hold water. But when I read John's version of the Easter story, resurrection frankly sounds very, very exhausting. Did you notice how much running there is in this story? Mary, she goes to the tomb before the son is even thinking about getting up, sees there's no body, so she runs in the dark, no headlamp, no reflective gear. She goes to Peter and this nameless disciple, we'll call him Beloved. She shakes them from their slumber, saying somebody's taken the Lord from the tomb, so these two grown men just break into a run without stretching Beloved kicks it into fifth gear. He outpaces Peter on the home stretch. You know he's going to feel that one in the morning. Peter and Beloved, they check out the scene and they go back home, not understanding what's happening. But who's still there? Mary is still there. Mary, who must have run all the way back with Beloved and Peter. She's standing at the tomb, weeping, shin splints, aggravating her already considerable sorrow. So yes, the resurrection story has so much activity in it. So yeah, resurrection sounds exhausting. Now I know that some of you still think of me as a very young person, but I am 46 years old, people. And I do not feel young. Muscles are groaning at me in the morning. I worship often at the altar of St. Ibuprofen. I stretch. I have even dabbled in essential oils, anything to make me feel less old. And I try to take care of myself. I try to stay in shape. During the colder winter months, it's not uncommon for uh, UPC member David McEntee, back row over there, I see you, to send me a text message, run tomorrow, question mark, meet at the top of Highgrove at 5.45 a.m., 22 degrees and beautiful. (laughs) That sounds so tempting, David, (laughs) but I might pass. No, most often my exercise these days involves CrossFit, Some folks in my neighborhood, we gather at the more godly hour of 7.30 a.m. to be tortured by our ringleader, John. Of course, if there are any F3 people here today, you know him by the name Spooky. And when it comes to exercise, you should avoid Spooky at all costs. He makes you do all kinds of terrible things. Devil's press, frog pumps, hollow rock. There's Russian twists and Turkish get-ups and Bulgarian split squats. If it has a nationality in front of it, it's awful. (laughs) And the list of exercises goes on and on. Ball slams and burpees and box jumps. Oh, my. But perhaps the most humiliating thing of all is when there's maybe like a 400-meter run sprinkled in there. I run with my dog Desmond. 
John runs with his dog, Copper. John and I, well, we start running at the same time. But in no time whatsoever, he and Copper are like a speck on the horizon. And every time, without fail, there's this moment when Desmond believes he can keep up with them, but then he remembers that he's dragging me like an anchor behind him. And he looks back at me, and the look of deep disappointment in my dog's eyes it is not good for the soul, people. Well, through all of this voluntary torture, though, I've been introduced to a phrase that I am coming to resent more and more by the day, the concept of active recovery. This is a good active recovery exercise, you might hear someone say. Have you heard of this active recovery business? When your body is pushed beyond its normal limits, when you really worked hard, your body doesn't need rest. What you need is to keep moving just a little more gently. The temptation is to say, I did it. Now let's take a day off. Let's take a week off, a month off, the rest of the year off. But no, the wisdom is that you got to summon the willpower to keep moving. That's how you remove the lactic acid from your system. That's how you recover. That's how you heal. This Easter story is filled with bodies that have worked hard. Jesus' body had been pushed to the absolute breaking point. Peter, too, had spent all Thursday night running and hiding. Mary and Beloved had stood in the sun all Friday long, bearing witness to the friend's execution. They each must have felt completely wrung out. The Bible will tell you what happened on Friday in excruciating detail. The Bible will tell you what happened on Easter Sunday, but there's not one single word in there about the Saturday in between. And if I had to guess, if I had to guess, I bet those disciples spent Saturday doing nothing at all. The opposite of active recovery. Maybe they didn't want to recover from this. Maybe they wanted it all to stop. Death has a way of doing that, not just bringing conversation to a stop as in a first grade classroom, but bringing life to a full stop. In this coming Thursday, it will be 56 years since Martin Luther King Jr. died on a Memphis balcony. The images from the Lorraine Motel, those are seared into the national consciousness. Joseph Luo is the photographer who captured them. He stayed just three doors down. He heard a loud pop and he rushed out to see Dr. King slump to the ground. And for a moment, he stood there on the balcony paralyzed. Death had come. And it froze Joseph in his tracks. He later recalled snapping out of it and thinking, I, I must record this for the world to see. So, so he lifted the camera around his neck and he captured the picture. Dr. King on the ground, surrounded by his friends, one of them cradling his head and three others standing and pointing to a rooftop in the distance where they could see the shooter getting away. It's such a helpless picture. Death had come, and all those men could do was point at it or take a picture of it. They couldn't stop it. They couldn't reverse it. They couldn't recover from it. Just, just point at it. And we spend our entire lives pointing at death, allowing death to stop us in our tracks, but Easter reminds us we can recover from this. Easter challenges us to keep moving. Easter demands that we do something with the life that God pulls from the tomb. So I asked him, Drew, what do you think about Easter? 
And with the honesty that only children can summon, he said, I don't really get it. <laughs> kind of freaks me out. <laughs> Man, I get that, I said. It is a wild story. And then I added, you know, Drew, I hope you'll always remember that Easter is a wild story. And you don't have to explain it or have to have it all figured out. It can, it can still matter to you, even when you don't fully understand it. And then he looked at me real serious, and he said, Have you seen the Star Wars bad lip-reading video on YouTube yet? I said, Yeah, I have. Many times. But let's watch it again. And we did. We did. We moved on to lighter things, but Drew helped plant a seed in my head and in my heart. It's Easter, and I can't explain it. I can't prove it. Resurrection is actually not something you think your way into. Resurrection is something that God does. And now, resurrection, it's something that God gives us to do. And it can be so, so exhausting. But resurrection is active recovery. When Mary finally realizes that this gardener standing before her was no grave robber, but the risen Christ, all she wanted to do was hold on to him, to hold on to that moment, to put her hands on her hips and breathe deeply and catch her breath. That's what she wanted. But instead, Jesus tells her to go. Go and tell the others. And even though she had already gone to them and run all the way back and was out of breath and had a stitch in her side, he still says to her, go. And if I had to guess, I bet she ran. Resurrection is the most active kind of recovery there is. God has already finished the hardest work, but there is so much healing that still needs to take place. The healing of our persistent hatreds, the stretching of our narrow tribalism, the reckoning with our racist legacy, the rekindling of our hope in a future that's good and the will to build it together. And Jesus knows, Jesus knows it will go a lot faster when we are actively engaged in that recovery. So he says, go. We are still very much in the throes of March Madness, even after Thursday. It's the time of year where I watch way too much basketball. It's also the time of year where, when I absorb the same five advertisements on repeat after every single time out. You know what I'm talking about? Well, there's this one commercial that stuck in my craw a number of years back during March Madness. I think it was a Nike commercial. But a newscaster's voice comes in. The world has stopped turning on its axis. I repeat, the world has stopped stopped. Top scientists are racing to come up with a solution. Well, a woman lacing up to go for a run looks over at her hamster running on its wheel, and she has an idea. And she breaks into a run off of her porch, calling out to others along the way, let's go. First, a group of kids join her, then some grown-ups. The crowd grows, and then the camera cuts to famous people joining in. Odell Beckham jumps out of a cab and starts running. Let's go. Giannis Antetokounmpo crashes through a fence, starts running. Let's go. Kobe Bryant jumps out of a helicopter of all things. And he yells, let's go. And he starts running. Simone Biles, Kevin Hart, Sadie Sink from Stranger Things, they all start running. Let's go. And before long, people all across the planet, they start running in the same direction to get the world spinning right again. 
You know, I have zero interest in whatever shoes that commercial was selling. Honestly, I have zero interest in selling you on Easter, on convincing you how it happened or even that it happened. Resurrection's not something we think. It's how God is setting the world to spinning right again when death wants to bring it to a complete standstill. Resurrection is active recovery. Resurrection is something we all do together. So lace up, everyone. Jesus is waving us out. Let's go.
Friends, please join me in the affirmation of faith. We love Jesus because when we look at him, we see the creator God. We trust him because he was humble, told the truth, and was willing to suffer, sacrifice, and even die. We are joyful that he did not stay dead. We do not know how Jesus overcame death, but we are inexpressibly glad that he did. We trust that the one who judges us most finally is the one who loves us most deeply. You may be seated. The poet Wendell Berry said, be joyful though you have considered all the facts. This is a church that does not plug its ears nor shield its eyes from what breaks God's heart in this world. And yes, sometimes that makes for uncomfortable conversations and sacrificial kind of work. And still, University Presbyterian Church is a church that is joyful. Joyful in responding to the grace of God that we know in Jesus Christ. Joyful in holy friendship shared. Joyful in singing our praise. Joyful in taking the gospel seriously and ourselves less so. And when we are generous, generous for the sake of our neighbors around us, it is hard not to be joyful. So let us now, with all that we are and all that we have, return to God the gifts of our tithes and offerings.
Our practice here in this family of faith is to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. You can see in your bulletin our ongoing prayer list, and I will add to that that Jonathan Robinson and Dean Morell both experienced the death of a parent this week, so we hold them in their grief. Undoubtedly, others of you carry heavy things into this room. Here, we bear one another's burdens, and we take all of it to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of promise, this morning we have come to see the stone rolled away, the wrong made right, the end transformed into a beginning, the sorrow turned to a dance of joy. And God, of course, when confronted with your good news, we find that we have a role in it. You tell us to go, keep moving, be Easter people, be Easter people everywhere, around conference tables and kitchen tables, in hospital rooms and classrooms, on screens and on work calls, across aisles and between friends. Go, that the healing power of the new life in Christ would be lived and breathed everywhere. That's a big ask, O oh God. And so if we are going to actually do this, we will need your help. And we realize that today you have already given us the gift of life everlasting and love unending. So we're self-conscious to ask for more. But what is prayer if not an honest reckoning? What is it if not audacious trust? And so we pray. God, give us courage, wild courage, to dream beyond our normal apathy, to take risks beyond what is reasonable for the sake of the world you love. And give us, too, the deeper courage that braves vulnerability. Give us a keen awareness of grace uncanny, pure grace, that our care for our neighbors would not stem from any ounce of paternalism or guilt or effort to earn your love, but instead from a deep sense that we are all bound up together, every last one of us, the recipients of your inescapable and unearned love. Give us humility. Self-righteousness is already covered, so give us a groundedness, God, a groundedness that recognizes that we don't know it all. And what we do know comes with all manner of bias. So a good dose of listening and curiosity would do us well. Give us joy, a joy that is not quick to forget the agony of Friday or dismiss the doubt of Saturday, and yet a joy that is contagious, a joy that frees us and frees others to brightly shine your light that emanates through us all. And lastly, give us wisdom. Wisdom to practice praying the prayer we were taught long ago. We pray it anew this Easter day, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that is only the beginning. Each and every one of us is invited to take part in the ongoing work of resurrection. So my friends, in the name of God, the creating Father, the flowing Spirit, and the risen Son, let's go. Alleluia. Amen.